So the next round of homeworks are upon us. Uh, you can feel free to, to take a look. Calculator and microwave. Building the internal functionality of a calculator or a microwave as, as with the first round of homeworks. It's a choice, uh, one of the two. And next week will be homework verification and homework uh, set up and getting started with these homeworks. Uh, so building that functionality for each of these without using any control flow, no loops, no ifs. Uh, no, no code can execute conditionally in these programs. So how do we make that happen? Yeah. Yeah, you can use the uh, values of type Boolean, yeah. but you can't say if this Boolean is true, do something else, do something else. No control flow. No. None of your code can execute conditionally. So you can't use x, you can't use borders, you can't use wires. Yep, that's what I said. That's <laughs> what I said. That's, uh, that's what makes it tough. And next week we'll talk about the state pattern that, that'll make it more clear of how to accomplish that. Right, any other questions before we get started? Yes. Right. Yeah, the homeworks are hard deadlines. Yeah, and the big difference is with, uh, with the lecture questions, anything pertaining to the learning objectives, I have that hard stance of all five or fail. So I'm going to have some leeway and give you more opportunities and give you every chance I can give you to be able to prove that you did complete all five learning objectives. With the homeworks, yeah, that's where you're working towards your aid. You've got to earn that. Uh, there's no, nothing too substantial at stake when compared to the learning objectives. The homeworks, those are hard deadlines. I need to know, are you keeping up? Are you really understanding the material to the point where you can have that A? You know, you, you gotta be keeping up with things for that. Any other questions? Wish this would stay down. I need like a weight. Hey, that might actually work. All right. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's talk about some polymorphism then. So today's lecture question, did I paste this at the bottom? No, I didn't. I, I just thought of it when I saw it now. I forgot to paste the lecture question on the last slide. We'll live. Uh, it's just only on the first slide this time. So this is the last question that I'll use, this, uh, the battery, flashlight, and boombox. Uh, I'm hitting you with it three times. That I'll lay off after that. Um, I was trying to come up with something else for this, and you know, flashlight and boombox just fit what I needed pretty well for this without having to create four other classes. So boombox and flashlight again, you do have to have the full functionality from the last lecture question to be able to get this one. So if you haven't done that one yet, finish that functionality and then jump into this one. What we're going to add to that in the same package is an object named use electronics with two methods. One that's going to take a list of electronics and call the use method on all of them. And then another one that's going to, uh, called swap batteries, that'll take two electronics and just switch their batteries by reference. So the functionality isn't, uh, isn't substantial here. Not too much to, to worry about in terms of that. I, I suspect that implementing these two methods, no one will really have much trouble with that. Working with the electronic class like this is just like working with any other class. So we're really not talking about anything too new when we talk about that. Uh, this is old territory. Where it's going to get a little more interesting is the testing. How do we test this functionality? And how do we get this list of electronics and mix boomboxes and flashlights in the same list and then pass that to our use electronic uh, method? So these methods only work with electronics, which is an abstract class, so we can't work with electronics directly in our testing, so we have to test this method that uses an abstract type by using its concrete base classes that extend that class and then test with those specific base classes instead of, uh, since we can't create electronics directly. So, uh, so expect the bulk of the work to be in the testing for this one. 
how do we test to make sure this functionality works when the functionality is built for electronics and all I can create are boom boxes and flash things. And still even then, I don't think this one's too difficult, um, but I do want you to get your hands on that, that idea of polymorphism that we'll start talking about today. And you're gonna do that through the testing more so than the, uh, the question itself this time. Oh, I, I left my notes slides in here too. Uh, if, if, you, <laughs> if you notice, these were posted like a few minutes ago. Um, so I didn't do all of my cleanup yet. I wanna do this just really quick. We don't need all the all my note slides on the website. You get a, a quick git demo today. Oops. Too much pressure. Can't even get my three commands here, right here. All right, if you refresh, you'll get the, the latest slides. You refresh on that. So, so with my notes, that was the, uh, if you saw that quick or if you download the old, old ones, that was the old lecture question with cats and dogs in a park and stuff. I just didn't like that question very much. So I wanted to get something new. Uh, so uh, we moved to this, these uh, boom box and flashlights. All right, so with that, Let's get into it. So we talked about the type hierarchy and what this means last time, where this is showing us which classes extend each other. And very briefly in an earlier lecture, I flashed another one of these with all the data structures in Scala and showed where, how all well the inheritance works for the data structures. For example, the list data structure that we're using actually extends a data, a type called sequence, just S-E-Q. So a list is of type uh, sequence and sequence has its inheritance, and there's a, a lot of inheritance throughout that. Uh, here's the, the very zoomed out view of the Scala inheritance tree, or the type hierarchy, where any is the base class for every single type in Scala. Every single type in Scala is of type any. If you follow its inheritance tree far enough, you're going to reach the any class. That splits into two major categories, any veil, which are the values that are going to go on the stack, uh, and any ref, which are the values that are going to go on the heap. These objects will be created, stored on the heap, and passed by reference, any ref or any reference. Anything that moves around by reference extends this, this class, which, ex, uh, which includes every single class that you'll, excuse me, that you'll create, every single class that I'll write in, in uh, in class, every single type we create is going to be uh, in any ref. It will be on the heap. It will be passed by reference or passed by value with the value being a reference. So, uh, so that's where we get that functionality from. Our classes in, implicitly extend any ref if we don't extend anything explicitly. And that gives us that reference, reference behavior. So last time we looked at some inheritance, we, well, we created these classes, we had this inheritance tree, and have our two classes that we want to work with in our game both extend an inanimate object, which had all the common functionality, and then we, in an inanimate object, we extended dynamic object by the end of lecture, so now our health potions and balls in our game will be compatible with the physics engine that, uh, that some of you are building for homework. That physics engine works with dynamic objects. Now, balls and health potions are dynamic objects because they inherited all of that functionality from the dynamic object class. So now we can work with these in our physics engine as dynamic objects. Dynamic object, we didn't extend anything. Ex uh, actually, we did extend game object. I should have added that. Uh, I was running out of room, I guess. Uh, dynamic object extends game object. Game object doesn't extend anything directly, so game object uh, explicitly. So game object is going to extend any ref um, at the end of that tree. So if we, we have our class here, 
Once we don't extend anything, we're going to have any ref in any. So what does this mean for us? It means that our health potion class in the ball class has six different types. And we can store a health potion in variables of any of these six types. So health potion, of course, create a new health potion and store it in a health potion variable. That's what we're used to so far in this class. But if we have a variable named uh, of type inanimate object, we can store this health potion in that variable. That's completely valid. We can do, uh, we can make this assignment which is where we're going to get our polymorphism from. This right here, that's, there's a lot of implications of this right here that we'll talk about. We can have any variable type that is extended by this class, and this class can work with variables of that type. They can be references of type health potion, can be stored in variables of type dynamic object, game object, inanimate object, health potion, any ref, and any. Uh, and this is going to give us a lot of nice functionality, as we'll see in a minute. So this is where polymorphism comes from. Poly meaning many, morph meaning form. Uh, a health potion, in this example, has many forms. It can be a dynamic object. It can be an inanimate object. It can be any one of those types as needed. Except we lose a little bit when we do this. So recall that we had the magnitude of momentum method built in the inanimate object class. So when we have anything of type inanimate object, we can call that magnitude of momentum method because that method is either defined in that class or inherited from, or actually uh, inherited from that inanimate object class. So when I create a health potion, I start in a variable of type health potion. I have access to mag magnitude of momentum because Health Potion inherited that method from the inanimate object class. If I store Health Potion in a variable of type inanimate object, I still have access to that magnitude of momentum class, or that magnitude of momentum method, but we lose the functionality when we have a variable, uh, a reference stored in a, in a type that doesn't have that functionality. So when I store a health potion in a variable of type dynamic object, that health potion still has the magnitude of momentum method defined in it. It does exist inside that object, and it, it's there waiting to be called. But when a health potion is stored in a variable of type dynamic object, since the class dynamic object has no idea about the magnitude of momentum method, we can't call it from a variable of type dynamic object. So we lose that functionality. Potion 3, that magnitude of momentum, that's a compiler error because potion 3 is of type dynamic object. Dynamic object doesn't have a magnitude of momentum method. Now the, the object in potion, stored in potion 3, that reference, of course, is a, in fact a health potion, and it does have a magnitude of momentum method, but when it's stored in a variable of a type that doesn't know about that magnitude of momentum method, we can't call that method. So why would we ever use polymorphism? I said, here's polymorphism, it's neat, and then the one thing that I can say about it is that it restricts restricts our functionality. So why would we use this? Uh, and let's take a look at our player class again to talk about why this, is, uh, why this actually benefits us quite a bit. Even though with this downside, we're going to see that this has a lot of power, a lot of flexibility, and helps us organize our code in some really, really wonderful ways. So in the player class, we had two methods here, use ball and use health potion which took either a ball or a health potion, and then just called the use method. Now these two methods have nearly identical functionality. All they're doing is calling a method called use, and then letting the object, uh, letting the input reference handle the actual behavior. The ball is going to determine what it means to be used. The potion is going to determine what it means to be used. And then each time we create a new game item, we can define its specific behavior when it's used by a player. 
So we have very different functionality in both of these, but from the player's perspective, inside the code at least, they're still just using an item. There's kind of this common, uh, common thing that we're going to do, that the player does. And this, having this set up like this, is a bit tedious. When we want to expand this game, we want to add those 5, 10, 15 more types of objects in our game that our players can interact with, that our players can pick up, that our players can use. We're going to have to add a new method in the player class every single time we add another one of those to our game. Maybe it doesn't sound like the worst thing, but as our code gets more complex, as these use methods have more than just one line of code, it's going to get, uh, that's going to get kind of unwieldy to work with when we want to add those new objects to the game. So what we can do is refactor our player class to not have a new method for each type. We're just going to go to the, the base type for each of these. So instead of use ball, use health potion, we're going to rewrite this as a use item method that takes an item of type inanimate object and the inanimate object has an abstract method named use that takes a player and returns unit that was implemented by every extending class. Since this is declared in the inanimate object class, we, have, we can guarantee that every inanimate object has implemented this method. So you might have been wondering last time, why would we have these abstract methods? Why not just not do this and implement the use method in both ball and health potion separately? Why even, uh, why even, even bother having an animate object have that method that's not defined? And this is why. So if we put that abstract method in the inanimate object class, now whenever we have an object of type inanimate object, whether it's a ball or a health potion or whatever, if it's of type inanimate object, I have a guarantee that it has a use method that takes a player and returns unit. I don't know what that method's gonna do because what it does, what that method actually does is going to depend on the specific type of the inanimate object, but I can guarantee that that method exists because if it didn't exist, whoever was writing this code would have got a compiler error and their program would never run. They would say, hey, you have to implement this. If you're going to extend an animate object and not be abstract, you have to implement that. It's a guarantee, it's a contract. Once an object extends an animate object, there's a contract that says, hey, I have these two abstract methods. Either be abstract yourself or implement these methods. So now whenever I have an object of type inanimate object, since it is an object, it's a reference, it's on the heap, it exists, I know it wasn't created from an abstract class. So I know it wasn't created from an inanimate object directly. It must have some implementation of this method. That use method must exist so I can call it. Now I do lose the functionality of balls and health potions, any specific stuff. If I want to know the volume of the health potion, if I want to know the uh, actually mass I still have access to, I don't think there's anything hidden in the ball class. But anything specific to these classes, I lose access to that because I'm working with inanimate objects only. But I, as long as I can get everything done that I need to do from the, what's declared in the base class, I can still get everything done. Here I only need the use method. I'm gonna call that method. And my method is done. This use item method, this one method, can now work with any inanimate object. If I expand my game to 100 different object types, I never have to revisit the player class again. I have this one method that just works with any inanimate object. So I have a much more concise, cleaner code, easier to read, easier to maintain, uh, easier to expand by working with the base type, that inanimate object type, and then extending that type whenever I want specific functionality. Now, if I have two different types, they can even be stored in their respective, uh, their respective variables of their respective types. And when I want a player to use them, I just say use item ball, use item potion. And we have this implicit assignment whenever a method is called. We create that new uh, frame on the stack. We create a variable of type 
uh, inanimate object named item and assign it equal to the value of the argument. So I have item of type inanimate object equals ball. That assignment's valid. Ball is an inanimate object. It's just like the assignments we saw in the first few slides where we can have uh, the, the health quotient stored in six different types. It's the same thing here. We have an assignment through the method call, a variable of type inanimate object being assigned to a, a value of type ball. Very valid, perfect. We just lose access to the ball specific functionality, which we still do have access to outside of the method. So if we still want to do ball specific stuff, we can do it out here. Uh, but when it's passed over here, it's treated as any inanimate object would be, and just call that use method. Same thing with the potion, use item, potion, done. One method handles every single inanimate object, even ones that haven't even been thought up yet. It can handle all of them. Uh, this is also important for, uh, for testing and maintenance of our code, as this, this could be a game that just keeps growing and getting bigger and adding more and more features. When we add those new object types, if we were not leveraging polymorphism here, and we were creating a new method for each item type that the player uses, each time we add an item, we have to modify this class, which is something we often don't want to do. If we create a player class, and we write our unit tests, we test it, we do a bunch of work, we convince our quality assurance people that, that this is a rock solid class, Every time we add a feature, we don't want to go back to that class, revisit it, make a change, retest everything to make sure we didn't break anything, test the new functionality to make sure that's working as we expect it to be, um, and also test the new feature that you added to the game. We don't want to be doing that for everything that we add, so we'll write the player class as generically as possible, test this one method once, and now this class doesn't have to be changed when we add new features to the game. So we don't have to retest it. We already tested it once. We know it works. Let's not touch it again. Unless we have to add player-specific behavior. If we want a new player-specific feature, we want to add magic points to this player class. OK, yeah, we got to go in here. But if we're adding a new game object that the player's going to interact with, but that doesn't inherently change a player, then let's not change this class if we don't have to. Any questions so far on this? Yeah. So after we pass the ball and then an inanimate object to um, that to use item, um, so then the use that it calls it to use of the abstract value, right? So it, it's the abstract class is declaring a use method, but there's no definition here. So it is seeing when I say dot use, since this is from the inanimate object class, I have a guarantee that that use method exists, but there's no definition in the inanimate object class. So when I actually go to call it, when this ball was created, it took its implementation of the use method and overrode whatever functionality was there, which was nothing. So when we overrode that, this object is now carrying around the use method that was defined in the ball class. So now when I call use, my compiler has a guarantee that this use exists, and when it's actually called, it's going to find that implementation that was defined in the ball class. So now we have different behavior based on that method, too. So this has different behavior. Use is going to be a different method depending on the type of the item that was passed, of the type of the inanimate object, the specific type of it. And that's, what, and that's the big... Uh, uh, the big point I'll make next week is we're changing behavior based on type, that big third bullet point of this learning objective. This is the primary way that we're going to do that. We're going to code to a base type, and then that type is going to be changing throughout the run of our program. So whenever we call its methods, those methods will actually be different each time we call them. But we don't have to write conditionals like, if we're in this state, call this method, else call this method. We're going to say, hey, variable, do your thing. And based on the events that happen, we might replace that variable with a different type, which will replace all the behavior, change the whole behavior of our program, but we'll never have to write a conditional to get that behavior to change. Now, there's a longer answer than you were asking for. <laughs> Any other questions?
Yeah. So basically, my understanding, probably this is like basically just testing my understanding of it. Polymorphism is a way of changing a child class after you use the inheritance thing to create the child class from the parent class. Mm -hmm. Use it, and then the way you do polymorphism is the overlay thing. Right, so yeah, you're extending the base class, yep. so you're taking all the functionality from it, and then anything you want to change or anything that you need to implement, like these are not implemented, so we have to implement them, we're going to override that. So like if you're like, find that right? here. and it was an uh, int, and it was like, let's say seven. Um, if you wanted to change it with your child class, would you do override and then just reassign it to five? If you're not changing the, the variables or the methods themselves, you would just reassign it. Like if you want to change the value of an int, just do it how we've always done it. Okay. Just say x equals 5 now. Okay. Um, so it's basically a fancy way of typecasting, but you're typecasting mm, the value uh, instead of the name structure? Not quite. Like, uh, yeah, not quite. Sort of, but not really. Okay. Yeah, not, not really, though. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about it yeah. after. But that, not really. It's yeah. it's a different, I just, different I just idea. I sort of related to like, other topics, so that makes sense. Sure, but it's a whole new topic. Yeah, I know. You gotta, I did so you, you're going to get yourself confused if you keep doing that. Yeah, uh, typecasting is a different thing. We can typecast if we want had that inanimate object and we want to cast it to a, if we know it's a health potion, we can cast it to a health potion. But that's a completely different topic. You can typecast like a string to an end. We got two strings. We're not two right? Yeah, we, we can talk about this yeah, later. Yeah. We don't have to take up time with this. Uh, any other questions on this? All right, so that was, that was fun. We, did, we got some better organization to our code, but we can take this a step even further. We can have our, like we did with an animate object, we had that extend dynamic object. Well, we can do the same thing with our player class, have our player class have physics applied to it as well, so we can jump around in the, the game, we can interact with the game world and have all the physics apply, have gravity apply, collisions, uh, all that stuff can apply to our player, just by extending dynamic object, forwarding that location and dimension, setting the velocity to the velocity that we got in our constructor, making sure we name it something else. And now every player that we create, every object of type player we create, can work with our game world. It can work with that, uh, with that functionality. You guys going crazy on Slack over there? Yes, sir. <laughs> My phone keeps going off. That's probably Slack notifications. I, I'm blaming you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I had to get rid of it. It kept vibrating. Anyway, um, so we can extend dynamic class from our player class and have physics be applied to our player as well. So now that we have, I know it's a lot of code, but a lot of it's mostly cut and paste. Um, so now that we have balls, health potions, and players all of type dynamic object, we can throw all these in a list of dynamic objects, put that list in a world, and then our physics engine can update that world, and all of our physics will be applied to those dynamic objects. Now this physics engine, I said this last time, I'll repeat it as many times as I, I can. The physics engine, when you write that homework, for those of you doing the physics engine, nowhere in that code did you say, if this is a player, if this is a health potion, whatever. You never know those types exist, and you do not care if those types exist. You're working with static objects, you're working with dynamic objects. That's it. Anything that wants to work with your physics is going to extend dynamic object, it's going to extend static object, it's gonna handle its velocity dimensions, you know, whatever it needs to set to get what it is represented as a dynamic object, it's going to do. And then that just works with your physics engine. So in physics engine, you might think, you know, before, if you're not thinking polymorphism, you might think, okay, you know, I get it. This is a homework with physics. You're making me do stuff. And there's, but there's only dynamic objects and static objects. This is super boring. We're just simulating some physics. But now with polymorphism, with these two base types, we can extend those, have 
each of those have its whole type hierarchy subtrees and have all kinds of different behaviors based on inheriting these types and having our physics engine work with those two types to be able to have physics applied to pretty much anything we can imagine. Anything that's going to fit, as long as it makes sense for it to be a rectangular prism, orthogonal to the axis, it's going to work, it's going to have collision detection. Uh, and then uh, collision detection, it's going to have gravity applied, it can have velocity, move around in this world, uh, and have all those features from the physics engine. Oh, no. Yeah, fine. All right. I, I, I was building up to a big point, but it's in like five slides. Uh, I'll, I'll get there. But uh, we'll revisit this. Uh, we'll revisit the physics engine and show how we can add more behavior. And I'll crack open the jumper code towards the end of the lecture. I'll j crack open that jumper code and show a little bit how that works. So the jumper code, for those of you who look through it, which I recommend to everybody, I'll reference that in lecture a few times as we move forward. The jumper code has a lot of starter code that you don't need to understand to do the homework. You're just working with the physics engine class, uh, but, uh, or physics engine object. Did I make that an object? Uh, but there's a lot of code there that you shouldn't understand when the homework was first assigned. But I'll look through that code in, the le in lectures as we start learning those topics so you can start to understand that game. You'll be able to understand every line of code in, that, uh, in the jumper game by the end of the course. Uh, so I'll often reference that and say, hey, remember when you didn't understand this? Check it out. This is how that worked. And I'll start that towards the end of the lecture today. We'll look at the jumper code a little bit. So if you haven't looked at it, if you're doing rhyming dictionary, I recommend at least pawing through that code a bit. Next week, we'll talk about it uh, uh, in, in uh, quite a bit because the jump mechanics of that game are actually fairly complicated. And I use the state pattern to be able to build some fairly complex behavior in that jumping. So we'll, we'll talk about all those states and how that state pattern works in the jumper game to get some, uh, some jump physics. Like the longer you hold down the button, the higher you're going to jump and things like that. How do we get those? Uh, running, run and jumping is a higher jump than a standstill jump. Things like that. How do we get that behavior? And mostly without conditionals, there's one place where I needed a conditional. but. Uh, but the homeworks are designed so you won't have those situations. Anyway, um, let's talk about overriding. We've seen this very briefly last, uh, last week where we overrode a two-string method. And I said, that'll make sense later. Well, now is that time. We're going to make sense of that. So we get some behavior, even if we don't extend anything. We have implicit extension of any ref, which extends any, which gives us some be default behaviors in some methods that are defined in those classes. Two of those methods are the two-string method. So we can always print something to the screen. Every, uh, everything in Scala has this two-string method. So everything can be converted to a string because it's uh, inheriting that from, uh, from any. Two-string, the default behavior in any ref has this behavior where it's going to print the object type at some reference. So if I, I ran this code and just the references I happen to get were these, I get the fully qualified name of the type of this object at, and then some reference, which is some ID, some re representation of how I can find this thing on the heap. We also inherit the dot equals method, which is implicitly called when we use the equal equal method. It's going to call dot equals. Dot equals, by default, as we know from the reference lecture questions, are going to compare by reference. If the exact references are the same, return true, else otherwise. So here we have three health potions. Only two of them refer to the same object. Potion three refers to the same potion as potion one. Even though all the values of the state variables are the same in both these potions, only two of these variables refer to the same potion. So when I say potion one equals potion two, nope, those are not the same references. These references are different. Potion one equals potion three, true. These references are the same. They refer to the same object. So this is the default behavior of the equals method. 
is to compare the references. Do these two objects refer to the same object on the heap? And we can change this default behavior. We saw this, uh, we see this in Physics Engine as well. And we can do this in, in any of our classes. Uh, we did it briefly earlier in the semester. We can override this two string method and give it any definition that we want. So for physics vector, for example, I want those printed out as we would expect a physics vector to be printed in the standard format for a physics vector. I certainly don't just want this is a physics vector at some reference. That's not ever what I want, really. Uh, but if we override that, we can get it in this x comma y comma z in parentheses that we're used to seeing. So we override that two string, that behavior, whatever behavior we inherited, which was type at reference, override that, throw that one away, and replace it with this implementation. So this is the new two string method for this type, for a physics vector. We can do the same thing with health potion, override two string, and the two string method leaves off the parentheses. This is something you can do in, in Scala. If there's no parameter list, you can leave off the parentheses. I don't always recommend it, but two string does do this, so when we override, we gotta follow suit. So we have this two string, and we just wanna print out the values of the variables. We don't want health potion at some reference. We're going to print out the values of these variables. Uh, to get some more meaningful information. So we're overriding that behavior that we inherited from those classes, from those any ref and any, uh, this one specifically from any ref, override that behavior with our new behavior with whatever we want. If we don't want our comparisons to be by reference, which uh, sometimes we want, sometimes we don't, but if we don't, what if I want to say two health potions are equal to each other if their volume is the same? I can override that equals, which is going to take an any as its parameter and return Boolean if they're the same, if they're equal to each other, according to the equals definition. So I'm going to take an any, because you can compare any two values. It's going to take an any. But then I want to check the type of this any. This isn't very helpful. With any, I have almost no functionality that I can use from a variable of type any. So what I'm going to do is some Scala magic here. I'm going to use a match case statement, which is going to check the type of this variable. And I'm going to say, if that type is a type health potion, store it in a variable named HP of type health potion and then run this code for the comparison. This that volume equals HP that volume. If it's a health potion, compare the volumes, and if the volumes are the same, consider these to be equal to each other. If it's any other type, the underscore is a wild card in Scala. If it's any other type other than health potion, just return false. I don't want the, any non-health potion to be equal to this thing. Uh, this syntax, I could also put this on separate lines. I can start a whole code block here and open brace and a close brace and have this multiple lines. I can add as much code as I'd like here uh, as a full, whole, full, uh, a whole code block. But the syntax allows me to put it in line, which uh, is just convenient for putting it on a slide. If I did the braces, I got to have two extra lines. It just takes up more room on the slide. It's the only reason I did that. Uh, but you can have your braces here and have a whole body of what to do in this case of comparing a health potion with another health potion. So we can change that default two string behavior, we can change that default equals behavior by overriding their corresponding methods. Now we run this code, we get significantly different output. We get the actual information, some, uh, some details about these potions when we print them out. And now potion one and potion two, they don't refer to the same potion. They don't refer to the same object on the heap. But now our equals method is comparing the volumes. These do have the same volume, so we're going to return true. They are both health potions and they have the same volume. Return true.
So this, this was the, the slide I was hoping, uh, I thought was earlier. Uh, so remember all that build up that I did earlier. Uh, put yourself in that state. So in the jumper game, we have this dynamic object, static object, and when we call collides with dynamic object or collide with static object, uh, when we call those methods, nothing really happens. It like sets a Boolean to true and remembers what it collided with. Uh, and that's only for, for our testing. There really doesn't have to be any functionality in those methods. They could be abstract for all we care. Uh, so there's no functionality there, but this is where we get things happening in our game. When we extend these classes. So we extend static object if we want a static object in our game. Uh, if you look through the code, I, I have this intermediate class jumper object so I can have IDs. So I can have a unique ID for each object. I needed that just to track my, the objects in the game for rendering on the GUI purposes. I needed the, those unique IDs. So I have this, and then my uh, platform class, every, all those platforms you can land on. Well, how does that work? They're static objects, but how do we collide? The collide method doesn't do anything. Well, I have platform extend jumper object, which extends static object. So this is a static object, which means I inherited the collide with dynamic object method which just like flips a bully into true and remembers what it collided with and what face it collided with. Uh, nothing interesting, no actual functionality. Well, now I want to override that testing implementation of this method with some actual functionality for the jumper game. And this is where we're going to use that face that was collided. If that face that was collided was the top of this platform, set the z velocity to zero and set the position equal to the top of that, the Z position equal to the top of that platform, so we're not clipping through the platforms. So if it's detected that we just hit the top of a platform, back the player up to the top of that platform and zero out its Z velocity, so we're not, uh, so we're landing, effectively landing on that platform when we detect that collision with the top. If the face that was collided is anything else, so if you jump up from the bottom and hit a platform, if you jump to the side and hit a platform like that, or if you have an internal collision, you're currently moving through the platform, nothing happens. The platform doesn't affect your physics. It's only when you're falling down, hitting the top of a platform, that's when you're going to land, and that's when you're going to have physics apply. So we have this fairly complex physics engine that's handling all these updates and collision detection, but when it's time to actually add features to our game, we're just going to override this method and say, when I collide, when a dynamic object collides with me, depending on which face it collides, have some behavior. And now I don't have to worry about all the complexity of the physics engine when I implement features in my game. I'm just overriding these methods that we're calling from the physics engine to be able to get different features. And we do the same thing with walls. With walls, I'm concerned with collisions in the x direction. So depending on whether you hit it from the left or the right, stop the player, back them up so they don't clip through the wall, and stop their, their x uh, velocity to, to mark that collision. So I can do that by overriding this collide with dynamic, uh, collide with, uh, dynamic object method. Just call it from physics engine. Physics engine didn't implement any features of the game. We're completely separating the physics from the game logic. But we can get the game logic interacting with the physics engine by overriding these methods and having objects with more, uh, more game-specific behavior just by overriding the methods that we created for the static object and dynamic object classes. So we have two broad categories of objects, static and dynamic. Can you move around or not? And, uh, and then override that behavior, extend that class and override the behavior to get different types of objects with different behaviors without modifying the physics engine. You write that physics engine, you test that physics engine, you're done with that physics engine. Now you can use that in any game. And we have a 2D game here for Jumper, but you wrote a 3D physics engine, you can easily apply that to a 3D game. It all just works without having to modify physics engine again. You can have all this code work just by extending these classes. That's what we really get from polymorphism. Write physics engine once, test it once, lock it down, never touch that code again, unless you want to add new physics features. If you want two dynamic objects colliding, uh, uh, that's the only way you would be editing that code again. 
but you use that physics engine in your other programs because the physics engine leveraged polymorphism.